This is the continuous visual integration talk. Thank you for being here. Uh, we got to go, go, go. We have a lot of things to get through. Um, so just a little bit about me to start. Uh, my name is Mike Fotinakis. I'm currently the founder of Percy, uh, Percy.io, which is a tool for visual testing. So I'm really excited to share with you some of the things I've learned over the last year about how to test apps pixel by pixel. Um, I'm also the author of two Ruby gems, JSON API serializers and Swagger blocks. Um, if you use either of those, I'd love to talk to you after, and, or if you have any questions. Okay, so let's, let's jump right in. So the, this will come in like three parts, the problem, the general solution, and kind of how it works, and architectures and methodologies, and all the problems that come along with that. Um, so let's start with the problem. So the problem is basically that unit testing itself is kind of a solved problem. Um, we have a lot of different strategies and techniques and technologies for testing the data of our systems, for the behavior of our systems, for the functionality of our systems, and the integration of our systems with other systems, and end-to-end -end testing our systems, and smoke testing our deployments, and we have, like, we have a lot of tools and technologies for this, right? Um, but how do you test something like this? So, I guess the color of the text has become the color of the button, or the, the button is now, or the text is now, uh, you know, has zero opacity, or some, something's happened, right? And this was, this was fixed by an issue. Um, or another example, here's, here's a 404 page of an app I used to work on. Um, this is just what it's supposed to look like. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. We launched a feature, and then four weeks later, we were told that our 404 page looked like this. Right, you've all seen this, right? Um, and of course, nobody caught this in QA because no one QAs the 404 page. Um, and you know, somebody, this was a simple change. Somebody had just like moved a CSS file, everything else worked, um, but the 404 page was the one that was broken. So then it got fixed, and then the fix looked like this. Um, <laughs> so you know, the CTA is totally covered up, and it, it didn't QA the fix on mobile, so you know, you're, you're still continuing to fix. And then I went and pulled, uh, pulled slides for this a while back and looked at the 404 page, and it was broken again, right? So I reported <laughs> this to my old team. Um, so this, in the business, this is what we call a regression, right? Um, and specifically, this is a type of visual regression, right? So how do product teams fix this today? Shout out the answers. Hire more people, okay. How do you fix these kinds of problems, what? Interns, interns? okay. What are the interns doing? They're what? They're clicking around a lot, right? What's that called? Behavioral? Exploring? I'm looking for a specific word here. QA, thank you, QA. Um, so QA is the big one, right? So, and this can, be, this can be developer QA, this can be you doing QA on your apps, this can be you have QA engineers, right? QA can mean, it can mean many things, but part of the job of this is to find these kinds of things before they, they hit production, right? Um, or, you know, that you get issues from your customers and you fix them after. Um, but QA is, is very necessary, but it's also very slow and manual and complicated, right? Um, and it's also pretty impossible to catch everything, right? Even in like a medium-sized app with just a tens of models, you can have hundreds of flows and thousands of possible, possible page states and permutations and constant uh, feature churn, right? There's, there's a lot of uh, development that's happening in these apps and you, you, you can't catch all of this stuff all the time. Um, so it's also very expensive, right? QA, you're spending manual human, often engineering hours paying for fixing these kinds of visual regressions. So let's go back to this, um, this button uh, problem and let's, you know, my, my standard fix to this would be like, can I write a regression test for this, right? I'm, I'm a big TDD person, I love testing, I write tests for basically everything, so like, let's, let's go try to write a test for this, right? Um, so here's like a, an RSpec feature test that, you know, tests this part of the app, right? It does simple things like it, it visits the home page and then it fills in some uh, text box with a title and it clicks a button, right? And then you expect that the page has new content on the page. Um, so there's a problem here, right? Like this test didn't fail. The, the button still technically works. It's just visually wrong, right? And this manifests in tons of different ways. So, so what am I supposed to do here? Um, am I supposed to assert that some like CSS computed style of the color of the thing or maybe that it has a CSS class applied but that's not really testing the right thing so I'm just not gonna do this, right? Um, and no one's gonna do this because no one wants to write a test that's this like fragile and inflexible, right? Um, especially in a, in a developing product. Um, so my normal approach is, is very useless here. Um, 
So the problem fundamentally is that pixels are changing, right? But we're often only testing what's underneath. We're testing all of our abstractions on top of those pixels. But this is an important problem because the pixels are the things that your users are actually touching and seeing and interacting with all the time. Um, and to go further than that, even with all of our current testing strategies and methodologies, we still lack confidence in deploys, right? You can have a million unit tests for all the different data changes in the world, but if you move a CSS file or change your CSS, you're gonna have to go look at it, right? You're gonna have to go check that and test it. Um, so let's, let's move on to the solution to this problem. And I don't like to say that this is, this is the solution. I like to frame this as a solution. This is not the be all, end all of all testing strategies that will make your, you know, your life perfect, um, but it's sort of a new, new tool in the toolbox. So the question I like framing is, um, what if we could see every pixel changed in any UI state in every PR that we make, right? Um, so that basically is like, you know, what, what could we do if we could test our apps pixel by pixel? So in order to do that, I'm gonna introduce a new concept. You may or may not be familiar with these. Um, they're called perceptual diffs, they're called p diffs, they're called visual diffs. Um, this has been pioneered uh, many times. Uh, Brett Slatkin at Google has done quite a bit of work on this on the Google consumer, consumer Surveys team. You should watch his talk. It's about how he accidentally launched a pink dancing pony to production, um, and then they ended up having to like, you know, do this style of testing in order to prevent that from happening. Um, so, so what is a perceptual diff? Uh, a perceptual diff is relatively straightforward, right? Given two images, what's the difference between these two images, right? Um, like compute the delta between these two images. And that can be this, right? So all the red pixels are the pixels that have changed between these two images without any context about what the image is about, right? So you can compute this basically for any kind of image. Um, so, so how do we compute these, right? Let's, or let, let's try another example. So shout out the differences in these two side by side. And then I'll, we'll th show the PDIF and see if you're right. Background color on the top. Lost the link. Capital N and thumbnail. Danger button's gone. Right, you got all of them. So this is the PDIF, right? And you can immediately see all of the changes in that image without having to sort of sift through it, right? All these pixels that have changed, these are the things that have changed on this page. Um, so PDIFs in 30 seconds. Let's go like do a PDIF. PDIFs are pretty, pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so I have these two images, um, just new and old, right? So let's open new and old. Okay, so here are the two images, right? And this is, this is just from the skeleton uh, like demo site. So you can see there's some differences in them, but let's go like make a PDIF and see what that actually is. So I have ImageMagick, the library installed, and I can just use the ImageMagick compare tool and compare old and new, and I'll store the image in diff.png. And then let's open diff.png. So cool, we have our first PDIF, right? Like those are all the pixels that have changed. And by default, it you know, applies the, the images underneath and makes it translucent and you can turn those things off. You can pass a diff bunch of different flags to this command uh, to like fuzz factor if you don't care that pixels have changed within a certain amount of colors or those kinds of things, right? So co computing PDIFs themselves are actually relatively straightforward. So here's a couple of PDIFs in real life, right? <laughs> Um, so if you try to figure out the difference between these two, it might take you a second, but the, the difference in this PDIF, you can kind of immediately see that the do you agree to the terms of use section of this page is gone, right? It just no longer exists. Um, and I kind of love this because this is a test for an error condition, but it's, it's basically like a back-end change manifesting as a front-end failure, right? This is a, a Rails form object that somehow has gotten into a weird state that is manifesting as this sort of front-end failure. And you, you might have a test for this, but this, this form probably doesn't submit now, right? You probably can't actually submit this form. Um, so here's another example. Here's, a, here's like a, a normal visual change. That's a visual change you actually might want. Like a new person got added to this page. So the visual diff is, okay, a bunch of things shifted around and like got reflowed and you can sort of like go back and forth and be like, okay, I understand that this, this page has a new thing added to it. So you sort of have to learn how to like read PDFs because they can be a little bit noisy, right? So for example, this one, they look the same, but in the footer, and you probably can't read that, but it says like, if type of jQuery not equal undefined slash, you know, something. So this one was somebody added a gem, which happens to inject some scripts into the page, and the gem was in a broken state, right? So all of their tests are probably passing, all of the, everything else is passing, but their footer has some junk in it, right? And you, you often can't catch these kinds of things without visual tests or you know, looking at it. Um, here's just uh, PDIF art. Like I found this in some diffs that I've done and uh, you know, an image got shifted over just perfectly to create this like, nice PDIF art. Um, totally useless, but kind of cool. 
Um, and also a br pretty strong signal in PDFs is if there are zero pixels changed, that's really important for you, right? Like in a, in a classic refactor of your app, uh, in a pure refactor, you're not changing anything that somebody's interacting with. All the plumbing's shifting around, you're changing ar architectures, you're upgrading something, but the actual thing that people are touching or the API that you're touching is not actually changing, right? So having a zero pixel change PDF can be a really strong signal because you get visibility into knowing that nothing has changed in this page, right? I can safely upgrade this thing because everything is remaining the same. Um, and you, as your app gets bigger and bigger, you wanna be able to do those kinds of refactors um, for your code health, right? So let's go write a visual regression testing system in two minutes. Ready, go. Okay, so I have this app. Uh, this is Giffindor, which is, if you went to Brandon Hayes' talk at RailsConf two years ago, this is his app. Um, and Brandon, I don't know if you're in the room, but you probably didn't expect that anyone was gonna go back and write tests for your demo app from two years ago, but we're gonna do it. Uh, so, so here we go. So here are some, uh, some like feature specs I've written for this app. And it, it, they do simple things like you visit a page, you expect that it has some content, you click a dialog, you expect that the new thing is up. Um, this app has just basic behaviors. It's just a stream of posts, right? And you can, uh, you can upload GIFs. And you can do simple things like you click submit a GIF and it does a jQuery animation that pulls that down and you can type stuff and there's a validation state, like there's a bunch of things that we all do all the time, right? So, so these tests for this are, are relatively straightforward. Um, so let's just go like save a screenshot at the end of this. All I'm doing here is using the Capybara uh, screenshot, save screenshots uh, capabilities. And this works with basically every web driver that you have except for rack tests. Um, but most web drivers support this. So let's, let's save that and let's go run the tests. R is just my bash alias for bundle exec R spec. So don't let that throw you. Um, and you should all have that, that by the way, because it's really, because you type that all the time. Um, so, wait, great, we've run the tests. Let's see, there's a change here, right? We can open old.png. Great, so we have a screenshot of like what our state, what our uh, uh, test looked like in that state, right? Or, or what our app looked like in that test state, right? And this is kind of a, what I call a complex UI state, right? Like you've clicked a button and some jQuery animation is fired in order to open up that top dialog. This is not just like a static page that you visited, right? Um, so, but you'll also notice it doesn't quite look exactly like the page we were looking at, right? This border image is all messed up and there's some other things going on here. So I, I, we'll talk a little bit about that later of like why that's actually not this, totally the same. Okay, so, so great, so we've saved our old image. Let's, let's, save it, let's change it to new for the new one. And let's go change the background color uh, of this app. So here's the CSS, let's just, let's just change the background color by one pixel, right? And we'll make sure that this other one is saved. We'll go run our tests. Great, so we have an old and a new. Great, let's compare them. And store it in diff.png. Open up diff.png. Cool, here's a pdiff, right? Like all the background pixels of this page have changed. Um, and you might think of this as just noise, right? But why would anybody care about a background color that you, you can't see? Um, but I guarantee you that there's a designer in this room who actually would probably want to know if this changes, right? And they want to guarantee that there's a consistent color palette being used and that we developers aren't sort of arbitrarily changing the background shades when we think that that's a new color that we should use, right? There, there needs to be some consistency there. So I kind of don't discount these kinds of changes as just because you can't see them at the eye, that doesn't mean that they're not important. So great, right? Awesome, let's, let's all do this. Um, so simple uses here are catching visual regressions, right? That's, that's the kind of obvious one. But then if you start thinking about this more, there's a lot of advanced uses for this kind of stuff, like CSS refactors and deletions is a big one, right? You're all terrified to delete CSS, yes or no, right? Um, because it's, it's scary, you don't know where that CSS is used, you don't know what legacy parts of your app are using that CSS. So what if you go add a visual def, uh, diff test to a visual regression test to your top 50 pages, now go to delete your CSS and see what happens, right? Um, and you, if you've deleted it and nothing changes on the pages you care about, great, you can probably delete that CSS. Um, testing style guides, especially testing living style guides is a pretty, a pretty cool uh, use of this. Safe dependency upgrades, so often your libraries, you know, they're backwards compatible, but they're adding new features. So you wanna be able to upgrade your libraries, but upgrading libraries and dependencies is also kind of scary sometimes. And you wanna be able to, especially if those libraries are providing 
front-end dependencies of any sort, if they're providing JavaScript behaviors, if they're providing, um, if your style guide is in its own gem and you're importing that and you're upgrading style guide versions, like up upgrading dependencies safely and having these kinds of visual checks can be really useful. Um, visual regression testing for emails is an awesome advanced uh, use case I've seen. Testing D3 visualizations is some, something I've sort of started experimenting with recently. Um, because testing D3 is actually kind of hard, right? Like you can kind of test, I'm, I'm not like a D3 expert by any means, but you can sort of test like the, the data transformations you're making, like your, how your inputs transform to your outputs and sort of how you expect that D3 is going to be able to visualize that, but wouldn't it be nice to just be able to be like, this is what it looks like, I know that that's right. Oh look, it's changed, is it still right? You know, that's kind of what you really want to test with those visualizations. Um, and then going further, what I really want here is a visual review process alongside code review. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So if this was all so easy, why aren't we all doing this right now, right? Um, and definitely somebody has said that if it wasn't easy, or if it was easy, it wouldn't be hard. Um, this is, it gets really complicated, right? There's a bunch of problems, and I'm gonna sort of hand wave over a bunch of, uh, of the problems, but I sort of bucket them in, in three different categories. Tooling and workflows, um, performance, and non-deterministic rendering. So on the tooling front, um, it's, it's kind of hard, right? There are some open source projects that do this right now. Phantom CSS is a, is a great example of one, right? Um, but it sort of presents all of your visual changes as a ton of individual test failures, right? And that, that's kind of a lot of information and a lot of um, failures for things that are, it just sort of, it, it confuses the line between like something being flaky and, and a ch or a change that you uh, want it to be and like an actual test failure, right? Or for example, um, you probably shouldn't have to require that you're manually storing these baseline images like in your Git repo, right? Like that's a big workflow tooling process that most of us are probably just not going to do. That's, that's a lot of work, right? Um, the performance one, I think this is the big one across the spectrum of all the open source tools, all the proprietary tools, all the everything. This is the big one that probably prevents us from doing this right now. Um, the examples I showed are somewhat contrived, right? They're, they're pretty simple pages. But in the real world, you know, I have some pages that are, when, they, when you render a full page screenshot of them, they're 30,000 pixels high, 40,000 pixels high, um, and that's, that's not crazy, right? So rendering and screenshotting that kind of page and uploading it, um, storing it, can take 15 seconds just to render it and another you know, five to diff it. So if you, have, if you have 100 of these tests that you want to do and they're all run serially, that's, that's 30 minutes you're adding to your test suite, right? And none of us want to do that. Your, your, your feature specs, if you're writing feature specs already, they're already too slow, right? And they're already too flaky. So that, that's a hard one, and I think the performance is actually the biggest, the biggest problem here. Um, and then non-deterministic rendering, which we'll talk about. So I'm sort of hand-waving over the other problems. If you want to talk about this more, I would love to. Um, so on the non-deterministic rendering front, simply, like, there's a bunch of things that change in browsers, right? We're not just doing static pages. So animations is the big obvious one, right? Um, so take this like pure CSS animation, right? If you visually diff this a bunch of times, uh, what, what, what diff are you going to get? You know, you might get this diff, you might get this diff, you might get this diff, right? These aren't useful to you, they're just, they're just kind of noise. So, so for example, in Percy, um, what we do to do this is we actually like freeze animations by injecting this particular CSS style into the, into the page that tries to like stop all of the, these animations from happening so you can just say nothing has changed, right? And if you wanna know more about that, there's, I have a post on blog.percy.io about how we actually do that. Um, or, or another one, dynamic data is a big problem, right? If you have anything on your page that changes, uh, in your tests especially, you're going to see a visual diff from those, so like a date picker is a good example, right? Um, and you can, you can sort of fix these with like fixture data instead of faker data. You can sort of like move in a direction where you're, you're having more like static deterministic things that you're using in tests, which I think is a relatively good fix. Um, but this is still a big problem and I have some ideas about how to, how to address this kind of thing. Um, so old test browsers, so like we talked about before, this, the, what you see on the right here is what was rendered by Capybara WebKit and what you see on the left is like what's rendered by Firefox, right? And these are not the same thing. There's like, a not, the border image doesn't work and the like, you know, the, the web font here is not a web font in this one. Um, and the problem with this is that often the browsers, the old test browsers that we're using underneath are not really modern in any fashion, right? Like Capybara WebKit is an old fork of WebKit that doesn't support these things. If you, if you Phantom JS all the way up until the new like 2.0 version, uh, didn't, doesn't support these things too. It was a fork of Chrome 14 from five years ago, right? It doesn't render the modern web. Um, it also has 1,700 open GitHub issues that are like basically untriaged, so, so go for it. Um, so that's, that's a really hard problem, right? 
And then some other problems like you can't really control for is this sort of like sub-pixel anti-aliasing problems. Uh, the way that text is represented on a page is not totally deterministic, right? These can, things might shift by one pixel. GPUs don't actually guarantee in some ways that like floating point operations will always come out to be the same thing, right? So if you have a gradient that's rendered on one machine and you try to render that same gradient on another machine, they may not be pixel perfect. They probably won't be. Um, if you compile uh, some code with different optimization flags, GPU floating point operations will be non-deterministic, non right? So the, we look at pages as if they are the same all the time, but actually getting them to be pixel perfect is a big problem. Um, some, some schools attempt to solve this with some sort of like, you know, open CV com computer vision researchy things where you try to say like, oh, is this a button? Has the button moved? And you sort of try to derive the page back from the image, right? Um, so that's, that's hard. So PDFs are only half the battle here, right? Um, so back to, our, back to our main goal, like what if we could see every pixel changed in any UI state in every PR, right? Um, and this is really what I think is the difference between like visual regression testing sometimes and what I frame as continuous visual integration, right? In the same way that like your unit tests are not the entire thing you're doing to test your system, um, and you need processes to like be doing continuous integration. You need to be merging changes with all of your other developers all the time. You need to be testing them instantly in CI as fast and as parallelization, you know, as parallelized as possible. Um, there's a difference between like doing visual regression testing sometimes and continuous visual integration. And these are sort of the, the big problem spaces that, that create that. Um, so, so that would require, being able to do this would require that things are really fast, right? There's a, basically as fast as your test suite. You, can, you need to be able to handle complex UI states. You can't just test a static page. We're not just here to just like look at all of our static pages. We need to be able to test components and all the different component states. Um, you need, and it needs to be continuously integrated into your workflow on basically every commit, right? I, in my mind, this can't be saved until you're either in production and even, even staging is like a little bit too late for me, right? Like I want this to happen basically all the time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit in the last part of this talk about how we sort of architected Percy to, to try to address these problems. Um, so here's like, here's how Percy integrates into like an R spec feature spec. It's basically the same thing that we created, right? You have a feature spec, it visits some page, it does some, some action on the page. Um, and then what you do is you just drop in, you know, Percy Capybara snapshot the page, give it a name, say this is the home page, right? So, so what's, what's that actually doing underneath, right? When these, these things get pushed up to Bercy, like are we, are we pushing up images? And I say that with question marks because th those will come along with all the problems that we noticed before, right? So we, we don't wanna do that. Um, so what we actually do here is we push up DOM snapshots. And if you think about this, like it makes a lot of sense because the most efficient, the most like lossless uh, encoding format for a website is not an image of the website or a video of the website, it's the website, right? It's your assets, it's your DOM state that you've created. Um, so we actually push up the DOM and HTML snapshots and technically we push up um, SHA-256 fingerprinted versions of those assets, so we actually never upload things twice. So the first thing might, the first run might be slow, but then after that it basically, my, my goal is basically to say like, you know, zero time is spent uh, in your test suite after the first run, but it's not totally true. Um, so then we do a bunch of like hand wavy magic underneath that to actually say like, um, you know, we push that stuff into storage, we can talk to GitHub and set commit statuses, we can coordinate work with this like Percy hub and actually, this is the big part where that actually addresses most of the performance issues is we can parallelize this, right? So you've pushed us up a bunch of DOM snapshots as fast as your test suite can go and what we actually do underneath is we run them as fast as your concurrency limit allows. So we can actually totally out of band of your test suite be parallelizing and running and rendering these, uh, these DOM snapshots in a deterministic rendering environment and then be able to like, you know, show those to you in a nice way. So this, this was the sort of like main innovation that helps I think this thing come to fruition. Um, so as of yesterday, actually I wanted to like talk about this, we, hit, we have hit a million visual diffs rendered in Percy as of yesterday. So I was really like proud of that milestone. Um, so here's a couple of quick Percy examples. I've t I talked to some of our customers and got permission to show you just a couple of, uh, a couple of pages to see just like what Percy the product looks like um, and how I've sort of been trying to address this problem. 
So here's, um, here's Charity Water's build, charitywater.org, and they, do, they have some amazing, they're very design-centric team, they're big, big Rails apps. They run, um, you know, they've pushed 162 total snapshots on every build, basically, and this, this particular build, which is called Footer, updating the new Footer markup, uh, had 96 visual diffs, right? And you can sort of like go through each one of these pages and just be like, oh look, look at all these Footer changes, and then this is the diff, and I can click that and say like, oh great, so I noticed that this like Footer is different on all of these pages. And this is, this is a lot to go through, right? So I just recently added this like overview mode where I can just like see all of my pages all at once, right? And be like, okay, and just confirm, like really quickly do a visual review and just confirm that all of these, these changes are the ones that I want, right? These are the visual changes that, I've, uh, that I have actually like, you know, we want to make as part of this PR. So here's, here's another example. Um, so this, this page is basically like, we're updating, you know, the, the PR is new press page and we're trying to uh, like update our new press page, right? And this one is just the first iteration of that PR where like they've removed some CSS styles and like, oh look, this page is totally breaked and it is totally broken, right? And they would never want to like launch this page, but it gives them this sort of like iterative review process where they can go here and they can say, oh look, oh, this is what our page looks like currently in this PR. And then also the important signal of none of the other pages have changed, have changed based on this um, CSS change, right? And then you can go through and you can sort of see like what are the other pages here um, in this app. So the, on the like workflow and tooling uh, problem, so this is the, the last thing I'll show you. Um, so we just provide this as like a CI service, right? We just like, as your tests run, they actually push information up to Percy and then Percy marks this PR with another CI, CI service right here. Um, Percy, visual diffs found, right? And we can just click details, jump right to the page and be like, oh look, this is the state of this PR, right? This is that background change that we made. And I can go through and I can decide like, yes, this is the right visual change that uh, was intentional for this PR, let's go ahead and mark it. So I'll do a little, this is the one HTTP request that my demo or that my talk requires, so let's hope that this works. <laughs> um, so, okay, so like I go here and I'm like, great, this is, I'm doing a visual review right from GitHub, I looked at these things, this is what I want, click approve. And then GitHub will, you know, mark that status as green, right? So now this sort of gives you like a lightweight visual review process for all of the different UI states of your app and at the PR level, right? Not like at some, some later stage. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically what, what um, this, this DOM snapshotting uh, mechanism has helped us sort of like tackle a bunch of those different problems. So that's it. Uh, I just want you to take away from this talk that like visual testing is possible. It's a thing, we should be doing it. Um, it's a new way to think about testing and it can help give you deployment uh, confidence, right? I think of this as like the last stage of the CD pipeline where you just need to, uh, like in your acceptance phase, you need to make sure that all of this stuff is looking correct, right? And you need to be able to approve it. Um, and that this is still a very manual step, but we can probably automate quite a bit of this. Um, and that also there's like a lot more work to be done to make this a mainstream engineering practice. One last thing. Um, so because of this DOM snapshotting model, I'm able to, I, I just wanna give you a sneak peek of something I'm working on over the next couple of months. Um, I wanna be able to do this for Ember regression tests or for, for Ember tests. So if you are an Ember user, I would love to talk to you. Um, just email me, mike at percy.io and let's talk about like getting you as a beta tester of this in Ember tests because I actually think that this is probably the world where this makes the most sense, right? Like, N not everyone is writing Rails regression tests or ra Rails feature specs in a lot of ways because they're, they're really hard to write sometimes. Um, but we are writing a lot of JavaScript tests nowadays, right? And as we sort of further separate our worlds to like, this is just an API backend and this is like a single page app front end and those lines become clearer and clearer, we're gonna have a lot more of these tests. And so um, to be able to get this kind of power, all we need to do is be able to send up those, those DOM snapshots and, and render them. Um, so if you're interested in that, please let me know and I can, uh, like, I'd love to get your, your hands on the beta. So thanks so much. Yeah, the question is like, what, do you, what is the baseline? Like, how is the baseline created? Um, so basically, uh, I think you can do that a bunch of different ways. I usually just pick like master, like whatever master has last created, that is our baseline, right? Um, and then I, we provide a mechanism in Percy where you can say like, I want a more manual version where I actually like approve a master build and that becomes the baseline. So I think it's, you gotta have kind of both, but yeah, basically I think if, if you're really doing like master is always green and always deployable, then you should always be testing against master.
Yeah, so we don't right now, right? I think um, we don't, the question was, do you do cross-browser testing? So I think that that's a, that's a, would be a great evolution of this kind of testing, right, is doing, doing more cross-browser testing. But it comes with all of those problems I mentioned, too, and you'd be surprised to learn that most browsers don't provide a full page screenshot API. Um, and Firefox is the main one. So I think that you can get like 90% of the benefits of visual testing with like one good modern browser, um, but then that would be a great evolution of this kind of idea would be to do cross-browser testing. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. The question's like, what tech stack are we using? Um, it's all custom built on Google Cloud Platform. I've like Dockerized all of the environments. It's basically a Rails API, a full Ember, strictly Ember front end, um, and the workers like run XVFB, which is a virtual frame buffer. It's all on Linux. Uh, it runs Firefox. Oh. Yeah, it's running Firefox, yeah. Oh, oh, um, so you're asking like, about Percy access control, like who can access that Percy page. Right now I just tie it to like GitHub auth, so it's, if you can see the repo in GitHub, if you have access, like team collaborator access to the GitHub repo, you can see it in Percy. Um, and anybody who can see that can hit approve, yeah. I haven't built any like complex uh, like role authentication kind of things yet, so. Yeah, I totally missed that part, so let me just do that quickly for the people who remain. Uh, okay, so, so part of this thing is we have all of these different um, like screenshots at a particular width, right? But we have the original DOM of these, so we can just resize the browser to a smaller width and actually show it. So here's like responsive testing. So here they have a 320px version of this, so now I can see the footer change in all of those different ones, right? So, and I can like full width this, and like this is what this page looks like, you know, quote, on mobile, basically just like at this, at this break point size, right? Um, so the, the DOM snapshotting model, model also takes care of that in that you can just like render it a different width. This is not testing on the actual device, right? But it is like, you know, giving you at least the responsive side of it. Um, the question was, do you dis can you disable the local test run and only have it on CI? That's actually the default behavior. Um, and then I've had some, some people ask like, I wanna disable it for only specifically this branch. And um, so there's an environment variable we provide called Percy, uh, Percy enable, which you can set to zero or one and it will force that environment to be on or off. Cool, thanks so much.